Up until around 10 years ago, this was the tallest building in the world. At least the tallest residential building manufactured from wood. Standing at a meagre 10 storeys and 32 metres high, you can, by modern standards, hardly call it a skyscraper. Today though, the tallest mass timber building stands at almost 90 metres and plans are in place for buildings as high as 350 metres to be realised over the next decades. The race to build the world's tallest wooden high-rise is one that has only just begun. But why has it taken so long for wood to find a use in tall buildings? The skyscraper, ironically, was born out of the rejection of wood as the favoured structural material in construction. On October 8, 1871, the US city of Chicago was ravaged by a tragic fire that destroyed a large part of the city. Many of the city's wooden buildings were flattened, killing 300 and leaving an estimated third of the city homeless. It was a grim display of the dangers of wood's flammability and in the years following the fire, building laws were radically altered, requiring the use of fireproof materials like brick and stone. The event came at the start of a period of rapid industrial growth in the US, central to which were the iron and steel industries. Also happening at that time was the rapid development of elevator technology, following the invention of the safety elevator in the 1850s. It was these key industrial movements, combined with an architectural shift within the city, that ultimately would lead to what many consider the world's first skyscraper the Home Insurance Building, which opened less than 15 years after the fire. Since then, urbanisation and the recognition that the vertical expansion of cities is more sustainable than horizontal sprawl has led to skyscrapers being an image synonymous to any major city in the world. But now another perfect storm has arisen. We have come to realise that the very industrial revolution that gave us the skyscraper is also the one that is beginning to take a toll on the planet. The built environment is responsible for almost 40% of global carbon emissions, of which 11% come from the materials and the construction of the buildings themselves. It's estimated that roughly half of a building's total emissions come from the energy used for manufacture, the majority of which goes into the production of steel, concrete and aluminium. Materials that were once considered revolutionary have met a point of resistance. But there is another factor at play here. Around 25 years ago, cross-laminated timber, or CLT, a new form of engineered wood, was developed at the Graz University of Technology in Austria. It's formed by gluing together layers of timber at 90 degrees, creating a structural element that's resistant in two directions. This, combined with earlier 20th century developments like finger joints and glue-laminated timber or glue lam, arguably changed the possibilities for working with timber forever. CLT offers a few advantages that are vital for its use in a structural element. First, it's a way to make a natural and thus inherently imperfect material like wood reliable. By combining smaller and thinner elements of wood into a larger beam or panel, it's easier to spot imperfections or structural weaknesses that may otherwise be hidden within the wood. But beyond a boost in reliability, CLT has also brought a boost in scale. In the past, the maximum size of a timber beam could only be as big as, quite literally, the tree it came from. That was until the development of finger joints, a method of joining shorter lengths of timber to form a longer one while still maintaining structural adequacy. The same argument can be given for the cross-section of timber elements which no longer necessitates the felling of older, girthier trees for the creation of thicker, load-bearing elements. Timber was no longer a natural product limited by its natural flaws and natural size, but rather had become a uniform, engineered and reliable material that would start to compete with the very materials that had rendered it redundant. The key properties of a structural material are a low weight combined with a high strength and stiffness. For high-rise structures in particular, a material's strength-to-weight and stiffness-to-weight ratio are both important parameters. Compared to concrete, timber performs better in both these metrics, and only slightly worse than steel. The ability for timber to regain its shape well after deformation also makes it especially suitable for use in earthquake-prone areas as it reduces repair costs associated with permanent deformation. 
But then there is of course still the problem of fire. Or there isn't. Wood is more flammable than steel or concrete, but that doesn't make a wooden building less safe in a fire. Consider a large element of timber that is exposed to a fire. If you've ever tried to light a fireplace, you'll know that thick logs shouldn't be used to start the fire, but once placed inside a sufficiently developed flame, they will eventually light. As the element starts to burn, however, its outer layer becomes charred. This charred part has a heat transfer coefficient far lower than the coefficient for wood. In other words, it acts as a barrier that insulates the wood at the core from the heat of the fire. It's the reason why, even after the most devastating of wildfires, many trees remain standing. As long as structural wooden elements are made thick enough such that the non-charred part is still able to support the same loads in the event of a fire, we can ensure a building remains structurally sound. Wood being a poor conductor means that heat is not conducted away to other parts of the structure that might be put under higher loads. In metal structures, however, these properties are not true, and so parts of the building far away from the local heat source will still feel the effect of the fire. Ultimately though, these are all reasons why wood shouldn't be ruled out, but not why we should actively rule it in. Wood is not as dangerous as most people think in a fire, and can be engineered to make it perform well under loading, but that doesn't make it better than steel and concrete. Except now, it is. Steel and concrete both require very carbon intensive production methods. Wood however exists as a material from source. That is to say we just need to chop down the tree and we have our material, no complex extraction or production processes needed. So little carbon is emitted in the production of engineered woods, but that's not where the environmental benefits end. Wood sequesters carbon dioxide. It's a common fact, and the reason why many carbon offsetting schemes use tree planting to negate carbon emissions. Once a dead tree begins to decay, however, that trapped carbon dioxide is released back into the atmosphere. The theory is then that by using timber in buildings and replenishing the felled woodland in the process, we can store more carbon for longer. A paper on this topic quotes that a 20 story building could store as much as 3,150 tonnes of carbon dioxide, whilst the same structure made of concrete would instead generate 1,215. The difference would account for taking 900 cars off the road for a year. There are other secondary advantages too. Wood is more insulating than steel and concrete, so has the potential to reduce energy costs, and the increased demand for wood as a resource could promote sustainable forestry schemes. Wooden buildings have also been associated with better mental health of their residents, and construction with wood is generally faster than that for similar sized buildings made of concrete and steel. So is this actually feasible, or is it just another pointless scheme pushed under the heading of being green? According to experts, the advantages of wood as a building material definitely exist, but it's the area in which their implementation is being considered that leaves some questioning its use. In the mass timber industry, the general consensus seems to be that timber doesn't make sense as a sole structural material for most high-rise buildings. Above certain heights, the acoustic and fire safety requirements imposed by regulatory bodies, combined with the large cross-sections of timber needed to support such a structure, means it starts to become uneconomical. Uneconomical on the cost side due to the increased complexity of using a more compromised material, but also on the environmental side. The more you have to treat and alter the timber to meet regulations, you lose the advantages gained by its accessibility as a raw material. And so, efforts in the short term at least would have a greater impact in the low to mid-rise sector. Hybrid buildings also make more sense where a combination of timber elements are used in conjunction with concrete or steel, but of course that hasn't stopped people pushing the boundaries of height. This is the C6 skyscraper in Perth. At least this is what it would look like when it's built. At 50 stories and 191 meters tall, it would be the tallest wooden skyscraper in the world on completion, although strictly it's a hybrid structure. Using 580 pine trees from sustainably managed forests that the developer quotes can be regrown in 59 minutes from one forestry region alone, and powered by 100% renewable energy, the project plans to be carbon neutral at the time of its completion. It's a true pioneering example that could change the way we think about construction and its impacts on the planet. 
Until 2002 in Germany, timber structure buildings could legally only reach a height of three floors. In Japan, wood frame buildings of five floors and higher have only been allowed since 2016. The trend is clear. Whilst the technology is there, the faith isn't yet, and many legislative restrictions still hold back the use of timber today. Whilst going high might not be the most effective way forward for timber, it's projects like these that will push the boundaries of the building code and develop the technologies for less ambitious examples to become commonplace. I'm Luke, and this was The Upshift.